how is everybody? Great. OK, good. Well, I was speaking to the folks at Google about today. And I said, what do you want me to speak about? And my job is to talk about innovation and change. And I said, well, when am I going to be speaking? And they said, good news, you're the first person on right after lunch. <laughs> So I said, great. And they said, make it really fun and interactive. So I've brought with me about 900 PowerPoint slides. Does that work for you guys? So I don't want you settling into your seat. I actually want you the edge of them, and I want you to get up out of them. So we're going to interact a little bit, if that's OK. So my job is to talk about how to create more space for innovation and change in your organization. And I want to give you very simple ways to do it. I'm not a retailer. I'm actually a futurist. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we get into the speech a little bit. But before we dive in, I, I want to step back, because I think there's nothing more annoying than someone on the stage that comes in and says, let's change. Because personally, I think change is very hard. And I mean it from a personal standpoint. And I think all of you here in the room can agree, change is not the easiest thing. In fact, I think it's a challenge. And the reason I think that is, is because especially with a lot of technological changes and just the pace of change, change is just not about doing something new anymore. It's about doing more. And with already full plates and full to-do lists, a lot of us are resisting change, either consciously or subconsciously as a result. And I started to really see this kind of pushback on change within my own company starting, I guess, about five years ago. Now, I have a team here in New York City. We're located right across from Grand Central. And I have 17 people. In fact, most are here in New York, but I've got a few that are in Singapore and in London and in Johannesburg and across the United States. But their job, these people that work for me, is to go out and train leaders like you on how to anticipate and activate change. So how to anticipate and activate it. And five years ago, they all started coming back from engagements, frankly, complaining about the same thing. And the complaint was this, the very leaders that were having us come in and teach change to their teams were the very people that were holding us back from doing it when we got there. Does that sound familiar? It was like, the analogy I give is, it's like we were being given a box of crayons. We were told as futurists to create this colorful picture of the future, but then only color within really specific lines, which is, in my opinion, completely ridiculous, because you know the picture that you're going to get. Right? That means no risk at all, and that's not what happens in the future. So I started talking to people, and that's where my book, Kill the Company, came from, which is not about killing the company. It's about how we approach change in all the wrong ways. The very things that we put in place to help us better change, right? governing bodies, reports, policies, procedures, those are the very things that I think put a chokehold on change. And rather than doing more with change or starting something new with change, I think the first thing you have to do is to do less. I think you have to kill. I think you have to do spring cleaning. I think you have to get rid of to create the space for more. And we set out to create a change program to help people create the space for more in very simple ways. And my goal is to share those things with you today. Does that sound OK? OK. So two things I'm going to accomplish. I want you to be inspired with new techniques. And the second thing is, especially as my job as a futurist, I would like you to feel a little uncomfortable. Because if you're uncomfortable, what that means is I'm creating contrast. Not conflict, but contrast. And contrast is how change happens. So if I make you feel uncomfortable, what I'm doing is I'm making you question your assumptions. And psychologically, that's how change happens. So let's dive in. So what I want to do at first is I want to play a game with you. And this is a futurist game. So I keep alluding that I'm a futurist. A futurist is somebody, it's a real job. It's not a business psychic. You can get a, a degree in it. It's a master's in science, a master's in foresight. And some of the people on my staff teach it at University of Houston Clear Lake. Uh, a lot of people in oil and energy and politics go into futuring. Uh, you can also get your degree in Manoa and Leeds all around the world. And the idea is there is a studied body of how foresight or change happens. People think it's a, a destination, it's a straight line, and it absolutely is not. We help you come up with possible, probable, and preferable scenarios for the future. Now remember, those things aren't linked, right? It might be possible, but it may not be preferable. So we help you kind of look for those signals of change. In the news is a game that determines how good you are at detecting signals of change. So show of hands by you here in the audience, who thinks they are good at detecting signals of change? Just raise your hands. It's not being filmed, so you can raise them really high, OK? <laughs> 
Okay, so a good, usually I get about a third. We're gonna test that logic. So I'm gonna read some headlines from the future that may or may not be true. I'll read them, I'll let them sink in for a minute. If you think that the headlines are true after I read it, you're gonna stand up and give me jazz hands like this. If you think it's false, you're gonna stay seated with your arms crossed and look really mad. <laughs> okay, are you guys ready? All right, here's the first one, I'll read it and then I'll tell you when to stand up or not. Look, my daughter's all ready to stand up already. Okay, hold on, Lindsay, here we go. All right, the first one, wait for it. Okay, Jawbone, fitness tracker, and Netflix, or excuse me, Redbox, right, the kiosk, movie kiosks. They are developing retail experiences that are driven by your behavior. Now, here's how it works. We all know that within a lot of wearables, we can have, well, a lot of it's locomotor activity. That's how that started. Now we can get sleep activity, even nutritional activity. Now we're starting to get into unstructured data. Our feelings and emotions are now starting to be captured in our wearables. In a pilot in San Francisco, there are five kiosks. People that have the pilot wearable walk up to the kiosk, the red box kiosk. They put it up to it, and it recommends movies based on how you're feeling feeling at the time. You think it's true, stand up and give me the hands. Be proud about it too, okay? Stay standing. This is good, you look ridiculous, so I just wanna capture this for a minute. Okay, so people standing, this is great. You are my visionaries. People, angry people seated, right? These are my change makers that are standing up. And these people are wrong, so sit down. <laughs> Not right yet. That's right. Now wait, he makes a really good point. Why did you stand up? Possible, po gonna be true at some point, right? Possible, probable, preferable, these things are already happening. Now, with all respect, don't tell my clients in other industries this, but retail tends to be a little bit more progressive than some other industries. I work with a lot of regulated industries. Pharma, they're very progressive. I work with defense, I work with banks. They tend to not glom onto these things internally, yes, but externally not as much. Looking for these weak signals, if they saw something like this, these are the signals they blow off. These are the things that they go, that's cute, right? These are the things that you have to pay attention to because cute becomes very serious very soon. Now let me give you an example of this, very light, but Dow Egberts, 300 year old Dutch coffee brand you all probably know, thought, you know what? How do we expand our brand? How do we do something different with technology? Just because we're coffee doesn't mean we can't get with the future. And what they did is they said, you know what, we want to be able to work with people, with our customers, and give them a cup of coffee before they know that they need it. So they did a pilot in the Joburg Airport, right in Oratambo, and they actually created a kiosk that would only dispense coffee when people needed it the most. So let me roll this tape, and you can get a flavor for what happened.
you get the idea, right? So that's kind of fun. That's one of those, how can I actually have those predictable moments, right? And those prescriptive moments to actually capture what people are gonna do next. But maybe there's other ways that we can weave in technology. If it's not a wearable, it's social media. So CNA in Brazil worked with Contigo Magazine. Do we have anyone here that's from Sao Paulo from Brazil? Uh, and Microsoft and DDB together created this ad, these like ads. Is anyone familiar with these? Where uh, people, when they went onto, the, onto Facebook, they could register for a specific version of the magazine. This uh, pilot subscription actually then came to their house, and I think over 1,000 people subscribed the first time. The reason you had to know your subscription is because when it came to your house, many ads were embedded with a chip with your specific profile on it. When you opened it up, there were several pages, kind of like who wore it best, where you could like one fashion over the other. The minute you posted or you picked your like, it would light up so you knew that it registered. It would be posted on your Facebook page of what you liked, and then it would register in store next to that item how many likes that item had gotten versus others. Pretty interesting in terms of weaving in social media and behavior. So what I want you to think about with this kind of headline is this. How are you going to use behavioral, prescriptive-driven technology right, to really understand or anticipate needs beyond what you normally think about? And even more so, how can you get it to facilitate use between channels? OK. Since most of you got that first one wrong, I'm going to give you another one. You guys ready? OK, here's your chance to redeem yourself. Here it is. BMW has partnered with USC, so the University of Southern California, to create a car with over 300 sensors. Why is this important? The car is designed specifically to make its drivers healthier. <laughs> Give me the jazz hands if you think it's true. OK, we have some ultra confidence here. Good, jazz hand. Wow, you guys are raising them high. So you know, half of you are just standing up because you're thinking she can't do it wrong the second time, right? I know it. OK, let's see if it's true or false. It is true. Well done. You guys all get a driverless car from Google. Congratulations. OK, all right, it is true. So I want to introduce this car to you and tell you why it's relevant. This is Nigel. It's a Mini Cooper. It is out, outfitted with over 300 sensors. And what's really interesting about this car is that it is designed to be healthier. So we know in the future, I don't have to tell this to our friends from Google here, people probably won't be driving cars. Right? We're, they're gonna, cars need to do something else. So if you're a car company right now, you are thinking a lot more than about mobility. You are thinking about far beyond cars in the future. You are probably not making cars. This is about the future is not who you are. The future is about who you are becoming. So it's really important to remember the future is not about who you are. Everyone in this room is a really senior executive. You should be able to tell me who you are as a company. And if not, to be honest, you should be fired. Your job and the winners in this room are people who are going to be able to tell me who you are becoming. And that is going to dictate who you hire. And that's how you win. So BMW is saying who we are becoming might, who knows, it might be a health company. So how this car works is when you sit down in the car, it will tell you how much weight you have lost or gained since the next time or last time that you drove it. So you know how much weight you've lost or gained. Uh, you put your hands on the steering wheel. There's basic diagnostics. Does your heart rate go up more when you pull into the parking space at home versus at work? And if you're driving into a polluted area and it can tell through its venting system, the GPS will reroute you to a healthier route. Pretty cool, right? Right? What are you becoming? So when you think about this, futurists talk about this is a very terrible futures wheel, but I only had this much space on a slide. But the idea is um, um, connections of change, right? So on this left-hand side, maybe in the future, it's types of transportation. And the types of transportation are it's human-driven or it's driverless. By the way, over 10 years ago, the first bet for the first winner of the driverless F1 race was already out. Maybe it's in the future, quite frankly, we won't have insurance. You're not going to be driving the car. There's not going to be accidents because there'll be sensors on the road. And the cars are going to self-heal. They're already doing these things. You don't worry about drunk driving because you can drink all you want. You're not driving the car. You don't care if grandpa drives the car because he's not driving the car. Or it's about logistics or it's about batteries. Who they are becoming is dramatically different. They don't want to make cars. They want to own a piece of yours. But what does that mean for you? Who are you becoming? And so I want to give you some dramatic uh, scenarios. Maybe you just change the channel. We talk about omnichannel. Maybe you do the opposite. 
right? We all know about these guys, Mintra in India. Now with Flipkart, they were acquired, and now it's no longer a website that was shut down on May 1st, and now it's at purchases. So they realized, I believe the stats were what, 80% of their traffic was through mobile, 60% of the sales were online, or 60% uh, of the sales were through uh, their phone, and all of it was really impulse purchases, so why not move to a different route? Or maybe you're going to go a totally different route. Maybe what you're going to do is add on a service. Big trend, products plus services, especially with millennials. The big thing is do it for me. I mean, the big thing with anyone right now is do it for me because we don't have time. That's the biggest commodity that we do not have. Do it for me. So you can be somebody like Enjoy. We all know the ex-head of Apple Retail and uh, CEO of JCPenney who started, hey, let's just not have online high-tech purchases. Let's have high touch. Right? Curate your sale. Come to your house. You'll be able to buy what you want, and we'll set it up for you right there. I love that. I hate having to set up my stuff. OK, great. So now you add it on and turned it into a service. What if instead, let me get to the next one here, you totally rethought about what that service is. Now, why do I have this up here? Because most of you always think about, OK, if it's products and services, that means we're going to take the product that we have, we're going to see the data that we have around it, and we're going to turn that into some kind of service that we can sell with it so we can be the experts with data. That's fantastic, but that's painfully obvious. So what else could you do? Why don't you be like Mars in the UK? So here's a confections company. And you know what they're really good at? Game theory logistics. They looked inside, and they said, you know what? Why do people keep calling us, our competitors, people in different industries, wanting to know how the hell we are able to fill our trucks and turn them around so quickly and get stuff on time faster than anybody else? Huh, we have a really good system going. So they actually package that up and turn their software into a, let me turn this, into a company called Freight Traders. Now this is very interesting. It's a completely different service and capability unlike what you would have thought. So turn an ops, right, into a profit, uh, profit margin. So they use this online system and they match companies to carriers with empty trailers for quick turnarounds. Whoever got the best bid obviously could leverage it. And people like Kellogg's and more started using their services. So did some of their competitors. And within the first three years, they did over a billion dollars in goods that they moved. You never would have put that together. That's about who you're becoming and taking a risk. So I want you to think about this. This is just for you to go with, just before we get into this one. What business would you be in in the future if it has nothing to do with what you're doing now? What would be a totally new business for you? OK, let's do one more. I want you to forget about 3D printing. I want us to talk about 4D printing. 4D printing. And here's what I want you to think about. Right now, the US Army, Harvard, and the University of Illinois, they are exploring ways of using 4D printing, which is basically self-assembling objects to create things like bridges that can just spring into shape. So the future is not 3D, it is 4D and everything just springs into shape. If you think it's true, stand up for me right now. I think you guys are just tired. That's really what it's coming down to. OK, you think this is true. OK, I think that's just weird. Because it is true. It's absolutely true. OK, nice job. 4D printing. So there's a lot of really cool talks you can go online, mostly out of MIT, to look at 4D printing. And the stuff they're doing, to be quite honest, will blow your mind. Will blow your mind. So 4D printing, how many people know a lot about 4D printing here? OK, I'd love just to stay and talk about 4D printing. It's so fun. So 4D printing, just as a definition, is creating smart objects. Right? They can be um, simple materials or simple polymers Right? that could just bend left and right when they come into contact with whatever element you've told it to, water, heat, air. And it, it forms a shape based on how you've programmed it. It can self-assemble. So let me show you what I mean here. I'm actually going to go to the video. Can you guys roll that video for me? There we go. So this is a simple polymer. This is, um, think of it like a plastic, right, an unassembled cube that it's been programmed that when it comes into contact with water, it will now, this is sped up 50 times, it will make its own shape. Now as you're watching this, think about the implications of this. It used to be man-made things, machines made things, and now the materials make the things. 
What does that mean for assembly lines? I grew up in Detroit. There was vast amounts of real estate, right? For inventory of holding things, for things to be shipped in logistics, for things to be assembled. Now there's machines that actually, brrrr, they assemble themselves, they make the stuff, and then they go into water and they disintegrate. These are examples of 4D pipes. A big problem with infrastructure right now in cities is pipes are going to burst. Pipes are clogged. Not if they're 4D printed. They can unclog themselves. They can brace themselves in an earthquake. Or maybe for you as retailers, what if you're a shoe designer and your shoe gets right out there and the minute it hits turf, up pops the, or grass, up pops the cleats, or if you're on a basketball court, for those of us mostly in the States, you could get something that has really reinforced um, fabric around the ankles. It responds, it predicts what you're going to be doing. So what's interesting for you is in the future, here's what I'd like you to think about. What are the materials and manufacturing processes that are going to just transform? Maybe things will just show up and assemble themselves right at the customer. Maybe you won't have manufacturing anymore. The materials do it themselves. Pretty cool, right? OK. Those that got three out of three right, you can collect your Google car later. <laughs> For the rest of us, I want to talk quickly about change, because I only have about 15 minutes left. So this is the kind of smarty pants slide. How do you think about change? This is how futurists look at change. And basically, this is how issues emerge. Here's what I want you to think about. How a, a trend starts and how it ends is basically, if I can sum it up, never, never, ever, never, ever, never, never, never the same. Ever. So for example, when a trend starts, this is, by the way, how aware you are of a trend and how many references or call it Google hits over time. The more Google hits, the more aware. Right? So when a trend starts, it's emerging. There's no terms. It's the crazy person in the conference room that's always giving you ideas that you wish would shut up. There's, a, there's no investors. There's nothing. It's just craziness at that point. Then it's framed. There's acronyms, social media, GMO, climate change. There's investors, early investors. Things are called platforms. There's competitors. Then it's mainstream. It's on the cover of a magazine. Lots of people are talking about it. And you act like you know what it is, even if you don't. And then it's resolved. And this is where there are lobbyists, there are laws, there are people going to jail. That's where that goes. Okay, Going to jail is the nexus of everything. But here's how it's happening to you. Okay, So starting back in, let's go at the very bottom here. Pardon me if you can't see this. Down at 2004, when you all were at Harvard or your children were at Harvard or you were receiving a magazine from Harvard, you read on a back page, because that's where the sexy stuff is, the boring but important stuff, back page, you read that there was that thing face mash. By the end of the year, it had a million people. It wasn't called social media really yet. It was kind of cool. You went into your boss. You said, we should really form a task force on this. And the boss said, I love it. Let's get back to work. And then, oh, it's framed. A blogger's picking it up. There's a, quote, platform. MySpace was the biggie, remember? Facebook was the anti. People are investing. It's getting hot. You've got teams now. You're hiring for this. And then the uh-oh moment. This is when I tell millennials, your grandmother has just friended you on Facebook. That's the moment there. right? It's over. And then here's where it goes, guys. Up here, and if you're in the States, it's the Supreme Court. If you're somewhere else, it's your high court, obviously. This is, has nothing to do with social media. This is about data. Quite frankly, it's about unstructured data. This is about. This is what a lot of insurance companies, um, financial services companies are talking about, a lot of lawyers, a lot of investors. What it's about is how much are your feelings and memories worth? Because that's what we're collecting now. How much are they worth? Who gets them when you die? That's where this is going. So why do you care? Why do you care? Down at the bottom of this chart, right down here, this is where you guys can influence the change. Right? This is the, it's free. It's guardrails. And at the top, this is the handcuffs. This is where you're taking orders. Right? At the top is who you are. At the bottom is who you're becoming. How much change are you willing to embrace? It'd be really interesting for you to think long and hard about, especially as leaders, because everyone looks to you for the change. How much change are you really willing to embrace? How radical are you becoming? So here's what I think holds you back from becoming. Three quick things. 
And this is human nature in all companies, mostly your companies, because most of you are big, you're multinational, you're established. And the, the more successful you are, the harder it is for you to change, to be honest. Success is like a big barrier to change. So the first thing I think that's happening within a lot of companies that might hold you back is that um, many of us here in the room or many of you are grooming not leaders but managers and frankly professional skeptics. You are breeding professional skeptics. Those are people that lead companies that are more likely to be able to tell me what's wrong with something that's, than what's right. That's a problem in terms of risk. The second thing is you have process over culture. Right? You like systemic change because that's easy. We can put a 12-step program in place. Behavioral change is more about who you're becoming because behavioral change is about skills and it's about who you're hiring and that's what counts. Who, demographics matter. And then the third thing is this, um, the current addiction to doing over thinking. And the reason that's important is because when doing has taken over thinking, thinking frankly becomes a daring act. Thinking is a daring act in many companies. And I, I tell this story that I sit on this, um, this advisory board within 3M. And I find them to be, I, I love the scientists. So the geeks are my peeps. I love these guys. Right? They're creating tomorrow today in my mind. And at 3M, they just don't think, frankly, they're very innovative. And I just, it's very humble, and I like that about them, but it's kind of crazy. And on this board, these are very patented, mostly men. And we were out one night, and I was talking to the neuro, I like the neuroscientists. I like behavioral change. And I was saying to this guy we were having cocktails with, I said, you know, I think thinking is a daring act within companies. And he said, I could not agree more, because the brain is the most important organ that we have. And I, I, I nodded, I agree. And he said, you know, the brain is amazing because it starts working from the very second that you wake up in the morning, and it doesn't stop until the very moment that you set foot into your office. <laughs> and I'm like, it's true. So, it, so thinking is daring, and here's why. Because most of you think thinking is about collaborating in meetings. I wish more of you would spend less time in meetings and thinking alone, because that's where good thinking happens. You grow ideas, I think, in collaboration. You come up with them often in isolation. What do most of you spend your day doing? Every, your everyday stuff, just shout it out to me. So we mentioned in the beginning I talk to 100,000 people a year. I ask this question of every group I speak to, and I say, what do you spend your day doing? First two things out of their mouths. I'm there to talk about innovation in the future, right? <laughs> Meetings and emails. <laughs> Meetings and emails. So I know when all of us get together, we're thinking in three ways. Right? Alone is different, but right now, we're all thinking in one of three ways. And I'm curious, just for yourselves, which one you're doing right now. So this is a little psychology 101 here. So the first thing is, in this room right now, there's 18% of you that are focused on what I'm saying. Raise your hands. 18% liars, I love you guys. <laughs> you're such your liars. So you're doing that because my daughter's here. I love you guys. OK, 18% of you focused. The second group of you, and this is 25% of you, you are having a completely unrelated thought or a sexual fantasy. <laughs> Raise your hands right now, OK? <laughs> It's always like the guys in the front that raise their hand. OK, the last group of you, and this is 57% of you, swear to God, you are doing something called on-demand thinking. On-demand thinking, in and out thinking. You're, you're listening, but you're also multitasking. You're, all, you're wondering about, oh, God, right, I've got that meeting i got to do. I've got an email. She's talking. She's talking. I say sexual fantasy. You engage. <laughs> and then you go back again. The reason I bring this up is this is what happens in meetings. And you as leader, you guys all in this room, I know you're the leaders. It's very important. It sounds like we're talking about really heady things about how we have to change channels and omnichannel, do all this stuff. The biggest stuff, you guys, happens in meetings and emails. It's a really mundane, stupid thing, but think about where you spend most of your time. And the person who has the most power in the room is the person who gets looked at the most. The person who has the most power in the room is the person who gets looked at the most. It's you. So you are looked at the most. What are you doing in those meetings? Are you engaged? Are you doing in and out thinking? Because then they will too. So if change is important to you, how engaged are you in it? So let's get you engaged in it. So I'm going to give you some simple tools, very simple. 
Very simple. These are things designed that you can take and use with your team in meetings and emails right away. And at the end, I'll give you an email. You can write me and tell me how they worked. If they work great, if they didn't, I want to help you make them work. They're meant to be simple, and I think you'll like them. OK, so let's warm ourselves up for these tools. Little brain power. I want to get you up here in your frontal cortex for these. I know you guys are anxious to be in your frontal cortex, too. I can feel it. How many people here are good at math? Raise your hands. <laughs> that's kind of sad. How many people here can add two numbers together? Let's raise it. My daughter's raising That's good news. OK, good. All right, so what we're going to do together, this is being in collaboration, we're going to add some numbers up. And we have to do it together out loud just to get up here in our neocortex. So if I said two out loud, you'd say two. And if I said two again, you would add it up and yell. Excellent. Here we go. I'll start with you, and then I'll fade to the background because I've done this a couple times. All right, so let's wake it up here. First number out loud, 1,000. Now let's add it up, 1,040. Next one. Good, let's keep going. Good, next one. Next one. Good, next one. Good, next one. I'm just looking over here because these guys told me you were their smartest client, so I'm getting a little concerned. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my god. OK. <laughs> Surprise. OK. So what happened? What did we do here? Pattern thinking. What else? Sheep. Good. So this, this is a great ex example of what makes you really great as a leader, makes you really bad as an innovator. You're taught to get to the answer quickly. You have assumptions about how things must be. And I hope that made you a little uncomfortable that you didn't get it right. Because you think you find the pattern and you get the answer quickly, and we all march together right off the cliff. Who typically gets this right? What kind of person? What kind of, come on, shout out. Who do you think? She said me. She is correct. Children, uh, you, did you get it, 4,100? No, he didn't. OK, great. <laughs> Lindsay, that's the wrong answer. That's the wrong answer. 5,000. OK, so it's, usually people think it's, it, excuse me, engineers, uh, CFOs. CFOs are the groups that I always get 6,000. They are not the right group, OK? <laughs> I guarantee. So uh, no, it's usually children. And the reason why is this is, um, of course, there's pattern thinking that we start right with people that have young children, of course, and they, we work with manipulatives. But um, we don't really fall too much into patterns, black and white, right or wrong, multiple choice, until a lot more standardized testing happens as we get older. right? And I'm a fan of testing, by the way. But I think there's different ways to do it. And the older we get, the faster we need to respond. And we miss the important pieces, the weak signals of information. The other piece I'll tell you, depending on where you sit in the organization, and I say this as a stereotypical thing, often this is, um, it's hard for the introvert to have a voice. And I will hear in a group, people say, 5,000, especially in Western cultures, because the person who says it loudest is the smartest. We follow that person. So how do you make sure for teams or people that are more introverted that they have a voice? So let's break some assumptions, and let's help your teams do it. So here's two ways I want to think about it. The first one is I want you to get better at asking questions. So we mentioned in the beginning, I sit on this group with the World Economic Forum, which is such a great honor. I meet these incredible people, and they talk about how in the future one of the most important skills people will need to have is provocative inquiry, the ability to ask critical questions. We, we as humans, and today, especially in the world we live in, are terrible. We, I, even ask my team if they were here, are probably very bad at it. How can you get good at it? How can you ask open-ended questions rather than leading questions? The reason this is really, really important, and this is kind of talking to the Google folks here who know this better than me, in the future, asking the right questions is more important than finding the answers. We have loads of data, loads, and we can find it very well. When you think about it, guys, Google is not a search engine. It is an answer engine. 10 years ago, when you typed in, when is, please forgive the American reference, when is George Washington's birthday, our first president? You would get a link, a bunch of links to pages that would give you the answer for when his birthday was. 
Now, when you type it in, it knows what you're thinking, right? It's more predictive. It's going to give you the answer plus more information than you probably needed right there on the first page. It is an answer engine. Are you asking the right questions? So let's talk about the questions we need to ask, and then I want you to think about it. So usually when we get in those great meetings, we don't think about the question. We're too busy asking, who's got some ideas? Well, about what? Right? I'm so stressed out, I haven't even thought about it, and you haven't given me a good question. So rather than saying things like, who's got an idea about, or how could we improve, oh, I'm, ar I'm asleep already in the room. What if instead you ask questions that were really right up here in that neocortex, open-ended like this? So if we had to give away, be extreme, our products and services for free right now, how else could we make money? Getting disruptive answers involves being extreme. Give me ideas that would get you fired. Very important. Here's another one. What question would we love to ask our customers, our employees, our bosses, but we are too scared or embarrassed to ask it? I love that one. And then the third one, for example, this is my favorite culture question. You've just written a tell-all book about our organization. What secrets would it reveal? Now that's, that's better than saying, how would you describe our corporate culture? Oh my god, that's so boring. So here's what I'd like you to privately take away here. Here's a question for you. Uh, some people are taking pictures, so I'll stop for a sec. Here's what I'd like you to think about. What's a killer question you would love to ask? Bonus points if you really think about, why haven't you asked it? Most of your answers are going to come back to, uh, most of um, complexity and change comes back to risk and fear. It's very human. OK, next one. I'm going to tell you a quick anecdote to kind of hit a point home here. And I think this will be your favorite tool. So the scientist, he had 10 monkeys in a cage. And he was going to perform a little experiment. He put a banana on top of the cage. First monkey to get it could eat the banana. And all the rest were doused with water. And they would get really mad. First day, he puts a banana on top. Monkeys struggle. One of them gets it and eats it. All the other monkeys have water on top of them. Really mad. Next day, same thing. Another monkey goes for it, gets it. All the other monkeys, water on top of them. By the end of the week, any monkey that goes for that banana, all the other monkeys pull them down. No one gets the banana. And so the scientist said, you know what? I've, I've got to change this up. Every week, I'm going to replace one of those monkeys in the cage. Take out an old, put in a new monkey. The next week, takes an old monkey out, new monkey goes in. What's the first thing the monkey does? Goes to the banana, all the monkeys pull him down. And by the end of the week, that new monkey knows, my god, don't go for that banana. But at the end of 10 weeks, now there's 10 new monkeys in the cage. None of them go for the banana. None of them have any idea why. This is what happens to us all the time at work, right? This is what happened. Well, that rule's been there for a reason. We've always been doing it that way. Someone smart must have put that in place. That person might not even work there anymore. Often rules outlive their times, and we don't question the assumptions behind them. So one of the tools that is the favorite of everyone is kill a stupid rule. How many people have rules at work that they would love to kill? OK. This is a, a great exercise. If you do this with your team, you are a rock star boss hero. People love you for it because they know you're serious about change. You're getting rid of the underbrush to create space for more. There's oftentimes things that have outlived their, their time. There's rules that aren't really rules. They're assumptions or cultural norms. Ask people this question. Give them 15 minutes. If you could kill or change any two rules at work, what would they be and why? and get ready for a plethora of quick wins to happen. Most of the things they come up with will probably not be rules. And then my time is up, so I leave you with this last piece here. And this is, this is your future that you're going to start to see. And the thing here is about making simplicity a habit. You are at the dawn right now where there are, we have many clients that have called us out of the blue and said, we have just established simplification teams. We have taken innovation out of our mission, this is very important, mission state, out of our mission statement and replaced it with simplification. We are divesting, we are funding simplification teams, and their job is to look across the organization, not just for efficiencies, that's obvious, but to actually make our HR better. Their job is retention. 
because if we get the work right, no more low value work, we get the culture right. And those are the people that win in the future. So if you had to create a simplification team, people in charge of getting rid of, if you hired a chief simplification officer, what would that person do for you? So with that, I'm just going to leave you. My time's up. So I'm going to leave you with this last thought, which is change is really, can be really exciting, but the reality is it is a choice. You do not have to do it. But do you want to be the ones that are kind of implementing that change or be the ones that are taking orders? I hope you'll be the ones that make the right choice. So with that, I have to say goodbye. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.